Hi, welcome back to educator.com. This is the lesson on evolution. So before we talk about evolution, what we know about the theory of natural selection and how it's affected life for billions of years on planet Earth, let's talk about the scientists who've kind of led to us understanding what evolution is. First, let's start with Georges Cuvier. Um, had a lot to do with fossil study and catastrophism. So the guy really knew his fossils, did a lot of um, studying of fossils, excavating, and he had this belief in catastrophism. Uh, it comes from the word catastrophe. He believed that major changes in, in the fossil lineage of how you get from, you know, one era to the next had to do with major natural disasters affecting species in a big way, um, you know, mass extinctions and stuff like that. Back in his day, that view was very revolutionary and um, he really didn't know what he was talking about. Um, so this fossil study and catastrophism combination did influence Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin read the works of Cuvier. Um, that definitely led to his background knowledge regarding uh, where life came from. James Hutton, kind of the opposite view of Cuvier in the sense that instead of talking about major events that had a huge dramatic impact on life in terms of changing it. Gradualism was what he favored. Uh, and, and you'll see later on in this lesson, there's a gradualism view versus what's called punctuated equilibrium, which goes along with that catastrophism view. Gradualism definitely counters the uh, catastrophism. Um, it's something that says that, you know, what gradual changes over millions of years or thousands of generations gets life into various forms over time and, and results in different species. So Hutton, a little different viewpoint than Cuvier. Thomas Robert Malthus, uh, oftentimes just went by Robert Malthus, had a big impact on not only science but economics with his views on population growth. Uh, he had a lot to say about what happens to population growth when there aren't enough resources to sustain the population and the uh, the negative consequences of having too many individuals for what is available in that area. Definitely has an impact on um, natural selection and the ability of species to be successful in an environment. So Malthus um, had an impact on multiple fields of study. Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, he, uh, he Lamarck, had a lot of impact on Tar Darwin because he came just before Darwin, um, born in the 1700s, Darwin born in the 1800s, and Lamarck had some thoughts and some writings that definitely influenced Charles Darwin next. Here are two things he had to say, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but these are general um, viewpoints of Lamarck. Use versus disuse. We know that use versus disuse has legitimacy even today when we look at natural selection. The use side of it is saying that, hey, if an organism uses something and it's useful to them, it's probably going to last from generation to generation. It's going to be passed on. It will be retained in the species um, and possibly exaggerated and enhanced over time. Uh, for instance, giraffe neck length. If you look at the ancestors of giraffes, their necks were not nearly as long not even close. Uh, so going back millions and millions of years, how do you explain how you get to the modern day giraffe? Well, if there was a, let's say an environmental change that made it where there was a um, drought that affected the leaves that the giraffes ate or the ancestors of the giraffes, perhaps there were less leaves on the trees. And so if there was an individual in the giraffe population with a slightly longer neck who could reach slightly more leaves and the rest are practically starving, well, the one that could reach slightly more leaves is going to be that much more healthy, is going to have more mates because he'll be more healthy and robust, have more offspring, pass on the genes that had to do with having that slightly longer neck. And if you continue a pattern like that over many, many, many generations, if you extrapolate that pattern, you could see how gradually there could be an increase in the size of the vertebral bones in the cervical region of their spine and contributing to the longer uh, neck size over time. And now you're at the point where all giraffes have long necks unless they're born with what now would be considered a birth defect, having a shorter neck as a giraffe. Disuse. The disuse thing um, definitely applies as well. Uh, the human appendix. So the appendix full name would be the vermiform appendix, is this little 
kind of tiny little sac that comes off of the uh, beginning of the large intestine, the colon region. And that sac can be removed through an appendectomy if it gets infected uh, via an appendicitis, and no big deal. You don't need it to live. It's considered a vestigial structure. It's vestigial. You don't need it. It's a remnant of something from our ancestors. So this is an example of the disuse thing. The best theory I've heard regarding the uh, occurrence of this useless appendix is our ancestors from millions of years ago who did not cook their meat, who did not cook food, they hadn't mastered the use of fire yet, they would have needed um, an enlarged sac in that region of their digestive tract to better deal with the bacteria and um, other things that would be in that meat uh, as it goes through their digestive tract. Once you cook meat and kill off bacteria and other microorganisms, you don't really need it as much. So once they started cooking meat uh, over thousands and thousands and thousands of generation, generations, it gradually uh, got reduced in size. Maybe a million or two million years from now, the appendix might completely disappear. Um, it's hard to say. It's just a guess. But um, there's the use and disuse that Lamarck observed and theorized about. However, the inheritance of acquired traits, this, not true, no, this, this is not true, because acquired traits is something you get or obtain after you've been born, you've acquired it, it was not born, it was not innate, it wasn't in you to begin with. What you pass on to your offspring is what's in your DNA, what is actually in the cells that you are passing on. The viewpoint that acquired traits are inherited would be like me saying, if I lost an arm and then had kids, my children would be more likely to have three limbs instead of four. We know that's ridiculous. Or um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, yeah, meaning if, if acquired traits were being um, inherited, that would mean that his kids would come out with greater likelihood of, you know, being able to lift weights and yeah. But that's not true. If uh, his children want to be just as good at, uh, you know, getting the Mr. Universe contest win, they'd have to lift just as much weights and have to take just as many supplements. So it, it's not true that acquired traits are passed on or inherited. Acquired traits can definitely make it more likely you're going to have successful offspring because if you acquire an ability or a trait and develops in you as you're living you're probably more fit in the environment in terms of having mates pick you and having more offspring and taking care of those offspring, um, you know, if you're a bird or a, or a mammal. So uh, what Lamarck contributed is really this use versus disuse idea. We now know that the second point, not true. Charles Darwin, uh, definitely the father of, of evolution in terms of um, what we understand today. And his theory of natural selection, a lot of it was theoretical when he wrote it in the uh, mid 1800s but the amazing thing is after all this time has passed um, you know almost 200 years since that's been uh, published a lot of what he theorized has now been supported and verified via evidence that he didn't see but he just had these good ideas about um, connecting the dots between what he observed so he proposed natural selection as a sound theory I don't mean a sound theory I mean, sound as in really good, really reliable, good theory of natural selection. And there's the most famous image of him, older Darwin, after his, his famous book was published. Darwin's Voyage. Mr. Darwin sailed around the world for about five years at the age of 22, when most people would be graduating from college, on the HMS Beagle, uh, HMS, his or her majesty's ship, um, indicating it was a British vessel. Uh, they definitely set sail from uh, the UK, from Great Britain. And um, Darwin, a quick background about him. His father was a physician, very well-respected physician, pretty wealthy. Um, back in those days especially, it was expected that your son would carry on you know, the father's work. Darwin was not interested in being a physician. Um, from what I read, he found it grotesque. He found it unappealing. Um, he was more interested in and just studying life in general about why animals and plants are the way they are and definitely had some interest in you know reading the works of Cuvier and other uh, researchers and scientists so he um, 
got permission to go aboard um, a ship that had a lot of cartographers, map makers, um, setting sail around the globe. And they were going to circumnavigate the globe, much like Magellan did. Slightly different path than Mr. Magellan took, but um, he definitely set sail with them for five years. And here's basically where they went. Most famous stop right here, the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador. Um, definitely the most famous stop. These are isolated islands, and like a lot of isolated islands, they tend to have unique examples of speciation, of endemic species. That would be the term. Endemic means you're not going to find them anywhere else. They're native to that place. So endemic species, not just finches, not just uh, giant tortoises, all kinds of really interesting animals and plants that you don't find anywhere else. And stopping at all of these island groups, and I realize that Australia and New Zealand aren't there, um, that's basically uh, where they went, more or less. They stopped at a lot of different islands, um, and w like I told you, the isolated islands that you aren't going to have a lot of immigration, emigration, emigration of animals and plants, you get some really interesting examples of speciation, which I'm going to tell you more about later on in this lesson. Uh, he gathered all kinds of data, written observations in his journal, sketches. He was a very good artist. Fossils, collected those, artifacts um, from plants and animals. And he used these to formulate his theory of natural selection. By the time he got back in his late 20s, much time went by between him arriving back on British soil and then finally him publishing what he had thought of and what he had, um, you know, come up with as this uh, formulated theory. He published the book when he was about 50. That's a lot of time between him coming back from this trip and the publication of his famous book. Um, there are theories that not only did it take him a while to like, you know, write it, and, and come up with this, this really good synthesis uh, of all this material. But some of it may have been fear. Uh, he knew that his book would be very controversial when he published it. And um, for, for the amount of people that um, uh, appreciated his book and thought this is a great theory, he had just as many people, if not more, that were um, you know, calling him the devil and saying that what he was, what he was claiming to be true um, was blasphemy.